Hi everyone, welcome to the Memorial Art Gallery's virtual artist talk with artist Koda Izawa and MAG director Jonathan Binstock. My name is Alyssa and I'm the Marketing and Engagement Specialist at MAG. I want to start off by saying thank you to everyone who is joining us and a special thank you to Koda and Jonathan for being with us virtually this evening. I also want to mention a few brief housekeeping items before we get started. We do have a live captioner with us today, so if you would like to turn your captions on, you can click the closed captioning CC button on your screen. During today's program, there will be time to answer questions that you've submitted. Please submit your questions at any time throughout this webinar by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Jonathan and Coda will answer some of your questions toward the end of this webinar. Again, we encourage you not to wait until the end to pose your questions, but to submit them whenever they come to mind. This webinar is being recorded, so if you would like to watch it again, or if you know someone who isn't able to join today, the recording will be available next week on the Memorial Art Gallery's YouTube page. Jonathan and Coda, thank you both again for being with us this evening. I will now hand it over to Jonathan and we'll get started. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, uh, for those of you who are able to join at this particular moment, I'm very glad you're here with us. Uh, I'm gonna take a moment to introduce Kota and then we will welcome uh, him to our conversation. So I am Jonathan Binstock. I'm the Mary W. and Donald R. Clark Director of the Memorial Art Gallery of the University of Rochester. And, and I'm really thrilled to be welcoming Kota to this conversation and to Rochester, really. Um, <clears throat> the occasion for this Zoom webinar is a, a real Kota Azawa moment here in the Flower City. At MAG, we have a work on view called John and Yoko. It's a light box. And at the George Eastman Museum up the street, um, they have on view Nan and Brian in bed, uh, also a light box. Both of these works are from Kota's uh, The History of Photography Remix series. But the most important exhibition happening event now uh, for Kota in Rochester, and it's actually starting tomorrow, is his solo exhibition, Kota, Kota Azawa, Taking a Knee. And that is on view uh, as of tomorrow at Deborah Ronan Fine Art uh, through November 7th. The location of the gallery is R1 Studio at 1328B University Avenue. And I'll share more details about uh, this, this exhibition um, later. Um, the exhibition, I do want to say up front um, that it, it includes the, it's, it's, it's called Taking a Knee and it includes the video National Anthem. And we'll see an excerpt of this video later. Um, uh, that video and also related works on paper. All of these works take as their subject, the peaceful protests of NFL uh, football players who have demonstrated against police violence and the racist systems that oppress people of color. Um, and, and, and these demonstrations were their actions of taking a knee during the national anthem. More on that later. It's really exciting to be able to share that work uh, with you, not only in this um, conversation, but also here in Rochester, the actual uh, work installed beautifully in a gallery setting. So I encourage everybody to get down there. Um, Kota, in general, uh, through his work, explores the appropriation and mediation of current and historical events and images, referencing sources from the news, art history, and popular culture. Uh, since the debut of his 2002 video animation, The Simpson Verdict, which we will see tonight, or an excerpt of it, um, he has been a greatly debated, um, discussed, uh, artist. And, and at this point, he's extremely well known internationally for creating light boxes, videos, works on paper, uh, that all distill found images into his signature pared down flattened style, which you'll get to know in a few minutes. Koto was born in Germany, where he began his undergraduate studies at the Kunst Academy in Dusseldorf with Namjoon Paik, among other amazing artists who were there, Gerhard Richter um, and, and more. Um, he relocated to the Bay Area, I think in the early 90s. Uh, his work has been shown in so solo exhibitions all over the world, really. Um, Museum of Contemporary Art Santa Barbara, the Albright Knox Gallery, and 
Buffalo, uh, Vancouver Art Gallery in Canada, St. Louis Art Museum. He's been in too many group shows to really uh, list them all, but some he's been in two Whitney Biennials, a group show at the Museo Tyson Bornemitza in Madrid, one of my favorites, SF MoMA, um, many more. And his work is collected uh, by some of our greatest museums, including the Met, MoMA, and Whitney in New York, the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, DC, the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal, the Baltimore Museum of Art, the list goes on. So um, let's welcome Kota uh, to our, to our uh, Zoom webinar here. And I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Are, are you, uh, I'm, there you are, Kota. Hey, how are you? Uh, thanks for the kind words. <laughs> You're welcome. We're thrilled to have you. This is a great, great little moment in Rochester, New York, and uh, we're really excited about it. Um, I'm going to, uh, there we go. Super. So um, let's, let's get going. Uh, you know, what I, what I would like to do, Coach, is just um, launch into the uh, first video. Uh, we have an excerpt from this very early work. I hope everybody can see it, The Simpson Verdict from 2002. Uh, you can adjust your volume on your own computers, but here we go. Mrs. Robertson. Superior Court of California, County of Los Angeles. In the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097211. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being, as charged in count one of the information. Superior Court of the State of California, County of Los Angeles, in the matter of the people of the State of California versus Orenthal James Simpson. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Ronald Lyle Goldman, a human being, as charged in count two of the information. We, the jury in the above entitled action, further find the special circumstance that the defendant, Orthal James Simpson, has in this case been convicted of at least one crime of murder of the first degree and one or more crimes of murder of the first or second degree to be not true. Signed this second day of October 1995, juror 230. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is this your verdict? So say you one, so say you all. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to the still image so that we can have it on the screen while we just chat a little bit about it. Um, this, this event happened in, the actual event took place in 1995. And you made this work, it's, it's your, your first work to sort of launch your career. Uh, it, it takes, you made it in 2002. So I'm really, at the, first I'm just, you know, it's not history. It's not current events or, you know, t maybe technically, it's sort of this recent past or recent memory. Seven years after the event, what, what caused you to turn to this subject matter? Um, so uh, can everybody hear me okay? Or can you hear me okay? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, okay, and I'll just assume everybody is. Uh, and hi again uh, to everybody who's uh, tuned in. Yeah, um, I mean, this was, as you mentioned, the first in a um, um, body of work, long uh, ongoing body of work. And the, my, the problem that I was trying to solve was how to translate a camera recorded image into an animation. That was really the task I had set myself out. And then spontaneously, I thought, what... Uh, kind of footage should I use? And the first thing that came to my mind was the Simpson verdict. It was a very kind of innocent grab. And uh, so oftentimes I only know down the road why, why I made something. I think it took, I, I'm not 100% sure that I could say today why I made it, but there are a few things that um, have kind of uh, become obvious to me. Um, as you mentioned, I moved to the United States from Germany. And the year was actually 1994. So uh, in the fall of 1994. 
And uh, that was actually when the trial was going on and the verdict was handed down in the spring of 1995. So basically the OJ Simpson trial was my first experience of the United States. And like everybody who was there at that time, who's old enough to have experienced it, I remember where I was standing. I remember who I was with. It was this kind of moment that cut through everything. And that's maybe one reason why I gravitated to, to it. But the other also has to do with animation. I mean, I find that what's happening in this video is mostly psychological. There's, you know, very little physical action. There are a few people shaking their heads and so forth, but there is no real physical action like in a normal um, animation film. And I think I was interested in making animation that has more kind of a psychological dimension and not just uh, action and uh, or fantasy dimension, which is more the common thing of animation. Um, interesting. And, you know, we have, uh, I, there's things I want to, that I'm going to begin to drill down into, I think, over the course of this conversation, um, because you've already hit on something that is interesting to me, which is this trial was your sort of first experience being indoctrinated into American culture in 1994, 1995. And, and, and in that way, maybe there's a little bit of you here. Um, the, the, um, let's, let's look at the next video. And, 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 and move through. We have lots of great videos, lots of great images, and I want to kind of give people a really rich sense of the range of the work, and I know that time will fly, and, and I think people really love looking at the art. So uh, let's do that. Um, and so uh, this is a, a video as well. This will be the, com oh, it's actually a 16 millimeter film. Um, uh, right, Kota? Uh, yes, so and, yeah. Go what ahead. you see is the digital version, and it's going to be silent. And but I, I feel uh, to me it's not a silent piece. Uh, you have to kind of imagine the rattling of the 60 millimeter sound projector. Whoever of you is old enough to have encountered one it has this sound. So whenever I show this piece, in I mean I'm not a control freak. So if people don't have a 16 millimeter projector, I also have shown this work digitally, but ideally it's shown on a 16 millimeter projector with the projector in the exhibition space. So you will hear the sound of the projector while the piece is running. Important to note. And um, let's take a look at it. it. It's the entire piece, I think. This is not an excerpt. Yeah. Oh, good. The image will stay up so we can have a nice picture to look at while we chat. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, this, uh, if it's on film, is it on a, a repeat reel? So it just keeps on going endlessly and you just go from the Lincoln assassination to the Kennedy assassination to the Lincoln assassination? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. It's an endless loop without titles or, uh, yeah, it's just continuous. So, so for the benefit of our audience who may not get the original reference, of course, the Lincoln assassination was not filmed. Um, there was no way to do that uh, at the time. 
Uh, and what, what Kota is using, what he's appropriating here is um, the, the uh, film uh, Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith, 1915, which is you know, a legendary film work, a, a cinematic work, a, a three hour feature length film, the, the longest film to date at that point. And it's really a, 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 um, uh, it, it, it derived from a book called The Klansman. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a film that positions the KKK as heroes um, who are gonna save the country. Uh, so this is kind of like a triumphal moment in a way, right? The, the, the death of Abraham Lincoln, the shooting of Abraham Lincoln. And then of course you have the, now that would be d documentary journalistic footage of the Kennedy. Uh, actually the, um, the film that the second part of my animation is based on is the Zapruder film, which was a um, uh, eight millimeter film made by a um, um, person who is not a professional filmmaker. He was just a um, person who, um, uh, I do forgot what his job was, but he was just watching the president's parade and happened to have his eight millimeter camera on. And his uh, recording of the assassination is maybe the, uh, it was kept um, uh, locked up for many years. And then at some point it was released. I don't forget which year it was, but it's to date maybe the most um, accurate uh, recording of what happened that day. So we're beginning to get a sense of the range of material that inspires you. Could you talk about the difference between um, this cinematic work by D.W. Griffith and the Zapruder film or contrast, compare, whatever you like. Tell us about your, your thinking. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very so. trial and error. I mean, there's, uh, we, we're going to see, I don't know, 10, uh, 15 pieces today um, that have made it out into the public, but there are also dozens and dozens that I made that never got shown or that end up in the trash can. So I'm, I'm fairly um, unafraid to touch anything that just kind of enters my mind. But then what, you know, uh, for something to hold my interest and to turn, develop into a, to a piece, even an animation that you just saw that lasts an, um, a minute. Back then I was working completely by myself, it took me five months or so to draw. It's uh, much more time consuming than it seems. Um, there must be something I would, uh, for this piece, actually, uh, when I finished it, I didn't even know if I liked it. It's uh, because obviously it's very violent. It's, it's not a um, happy piece at all. It uh, doesn't carry any uplifting message. Uh, but I felt the piece just had to be done. The, it was the material landed in my hands and I felt these two events are so closely connected that I had to just finish the piece. <laughs> and uh, if I may add this, this is not necessarily a direct uh, answer to your question, but the first, um, I, I make these pieces also out of my own impulse without necessarily a show in mind. But the first um, organization that wanted to show this piece uh, was a gallery in New York that no longer exists, it was called the Wrong Gallery. Oh, yeah. it was by Maurizio Catalan and Massimiliano Gioni and um, one other member of whose name I forget right the second, please excuse me for that. And uh, I thought it was a perfect place because they had this kind of outlaw um, thing about their gallery. And uh, to me, this piece is also, there's something wrong about this piece too. So that's why I thought the gallery was good. Yeah, there is right. Like, like, let's 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 look at that. I mean, we're looking at an image of the landscape around uh, the Kennedy assassination, and and there's a tree. You know, there's a road. I mean, but it's actually very abstract. Um, there aren't even any black lines outlining the elements of the composition. It's just shapes and color, which um, give you enough information to help you understand what you're looking at and what the subject matter is, but, but not, a, not a tremendous amount of information. I mean, it's very cool. You know, you've 
you've been compared with sort of, um, you know, painters like Alex Katz and uh, color by numbers techniques. And some people have talked, compared you uh, in, in a visual style with um, South Park animation. And, you know, it, it is wrong in a way because you're dealing with this really intense subject matter. I mean, it's, and these are tragedies of the worst kind uh, or, you know, among the worst kind. I mean, there's tragedies or tragedies, uh, but it, <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a charm to your style. There's a, a sense of whimsy to your style. It's clearly a cart, you know, a reference to animation, even if it's, even if the images are still, um, what, uh, are you taking, are you trying to not only reduce the imagery, but reduce the emotion or reduce the um, impact or? Actually, I feel quite the opposite. Um, uh, this kind of reduction, you could also call it stylization, is uh, I, I do wanna, I, I, first of all, why I gravitate also to these images is because I myself have an emotional response to them. And then when I uh, share these images with viewers or an audience, I want them to feel, have an emotional response to it. doesn't always happen. You know, some people don't care about what I make, but um, I feel that actually stylization is a means to elicit uh, emotional response from the viewer. It's uh, theater, um, animation, uh, any kind of kind of fictional art forms use stylization as a means to to actually evoke emotion in the viewer. Hmm. And, and then, the, for example, this kind of, I'm not a trained animator. I didn't go to an animation school. I didn't go to Cal Arts or I went to a school where we talked about ideas and concepts and uh, about books. And this whole animation process, I taught myself. I'm a self-taught animator. And in the beginning, and this is one of the early pieces, it was just as complicated as I could do it with my own humble means. Hmm. But then there were, it's not only that, but it's also, I really believe in color, I guess. I find color is kind of to the eye what uh, chords or harmonies are to the ear. I, I really think that color is also a tool to evoke emotion in the um, in the viewer. And I'm not a big fan of outlines and black lines. I think they're almost like text. They just kind of delineate things and spell things out. So I think color is much more powerful as a, for me as a as a for, format to communicate with the viewer. And it's 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 more radical. You know, it's more um, on, and, and that's why I'm having a hard time kind of, you know, we can range and, and kind of, well, wait, are, are we, are we, you know, what, what's happening with the emotional content here? You know, you're telling me, and it is, because you know, I'm glued to the images. They're riveting. And I've watched now these a few times and, and they're brief clips, but every, I, I'm really into watching them. I'm, I'm, I'm never wanting uh, for the, the, the inspiration to look at these pictures and these animations. Um, I think it has a lot to do with your style and it has a lot to do with the way you're creating a new lens for um, f helping us to focus on images that are so ingrained in, in our sort of cultural minds. Um, what, um, tell us a little bit about your process. So, so how do you animate? What, what, how do you make these things? Uh, yeah, it's also, like I said, it's, um, it's a, first of all, I should say it's a manual process. It's not that I press on a button and then the, my computer spits out this animation. It's, uh, I, so I select certain still images from the uh, footage that I use and then I trace them on the computer. And then these tracings I animate to kind of replicate the original film. So it's, yeah, I feel it's almost like reverse engineering a piece of film uh, mm -hmm. with, my, um, with my tool set. Yeah, we're gonna have to talk about Warhol at some point because you're talking about tracings and you're, you know, he would project an image and, and uh, uh, on a piece of paper and trace the image and it was a new drawing. And of course, 
you know, some, somebody might say, well, he's cheating. Uh, somebody else might say, no, it's like a whole other kind of process. David Hockney would disagree with the whole cheating um, explanation. And, and, and he would say, uh, tracing um, a representation is another, simply another way to create. It uses a different skill set, a different sense of line, a different sense of um, eye to hand um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, relationship. Let's, um, let's go to the next image. You know, the, the funny, the sad thing is <laughs> I have all these notes that I wrote and um, I thought I would be able to look at them at the same time as I'm talking to you, but nope. <laughs> so here we go. Um, all right, so now we're into the history of photography um, remix series. And we have a number of these, maybe maybe five or six of these to, to roll through. This is the body of work that's on view at the Memorial Art Gallery and the George Eastman Museum, or at least examples from that series are. And, and this image is Pioneer. And I know uh, um, uh, something about these image of, images, of course, Kota, because we had a conversation in advance of this. But um, I think uh, we're, you know, we're looking at a a, a, an early uh, modern, maybe constructivist uh, uh, image of uh, a pioneer. So tell us what what was a pioneer and-, and uh, Okay, and yeah, well, you're the art historian, so you would probably do a much better job of telling people the source of this image, but it's a important photograph from the canon of the history of photography by Alexander Rochenko and um, yeah, the, the important thing about it is that it was the, the kind of perspective. Um, this was taken in the early 20th century. Until then, there was only kind of full frontal portrait photography of human beings. There was never uh, someone, an image taken from above. And I think he took this from the balcony of his apartment of a, a young person standing in the street in the early days of the Soviet Union. And um, I mean, uh, if you want to know more about Alexander Rojenko's photograph, Google him. And uh, he's, um, has, like I said, he's an important figure of the early uh, modern photography. But then what I try to do is I'm kind of a fan of all these essays that have been written on photography by Susan Sontag or Walter Benjamin. And I'm not also, uh, please don't get me wrong, I'm not a heavy duty intellectual that, but just these uh, essays that every grad student at art has to read, like um, uh, on photography by Susan Sontag or uh, um, uh, the short history by photog of photography by Walter Benjamin. They talk about these things like, Walter Benjamin talks about the patina of a photograph. And then what I thought, what my process does is really just like scrape off the patina of a photograph. Like um, this could have also taken place in 2012, you know, by the way I represent these uh, images, they lose their moment in time and they become just kind of more abstract and more. Um, and so while for you, it's probably fun to know this is based on a Rojenko photograph, I'm also okay if somebody just looks at it and says like, I really like how simple this is, or I would like to have that on my wall. I don't think you can only um, think about this as a art historical reference, it's also, some black and white shapes in a square format. Well, my first joke of the evening is uh, you're, you may not be an in, a heavy duty intellectual, but you play one on TV. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, <laughs> weird. So, I'm the, yeah, I mean, just for, just to, just, I'm from a um, family of academics. I'm one of the few people in my immediate family that doesn't have a PhD. Mm. So I was always the quiet one at the dinner table, actually. And, but because I heard my super smart sister and my father and my mother have all these discussions, I can kind of fake it well enough. <laughs> so um, I'm actually going to go backwards because people are sending in um, good, really interesting questions. And I want to uh, just look at this image. Um, uh, Alan, our friend Alan Topolsky asks, um, 
how do, and, and you, we were talking around this, but he, he, he really is um, pinpointing something. How, how do the flatness of the images and the video's proximity to stillness relate to each other and the gravity of the subjects? So he's, he's kind of, uh, that's a tough, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, mm -hmm. a gentle question, but it kind of, it, it may be the question that I wanted to ask, you know? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I feel they're all separate parts, but they, you know, they come together. Um, flatness, I mean, flatness has been, played a role in, in art for a long time since, I mean, the pop artist and, uh, Jasper Johns and all this. It was a competition who can make the flattest painting. So I've, I'm kind of like joining the comp competition of trying to make very flat pieces, but it doesn't only take place in the Western world. Also, uh, the Japanese artists like Murakami had the super flat manifesto. So there's something about flatness that I find very appealing. Um, the how it translates in the, I, I, I don't know if I remember the word that was used in the question, but to the style of animation or the... Well, no, it was how do these things ultimately relate to the gravity of the subject? You've chosen such... Maybe they don't. Uh, maybe, maybe the answer is that they, uh, they don't, but I feel they do something with it. It's, it's kind of... Yeah. The gravity, I find, you know, it's just, I mean, this, this particular one is the heavy duty one. Uh, this is, uh, you can't say this is, although it's called the unbearable lightness of being, it's not necessarily a light piece. Um, but I, uh, I like to, rather than calling it gravity, I like to call it uh, kind of something that many people can connect to. These are events that not just like a few uh, of us have uh, heard about this is something that's kind of common knowledge and I like to use these kind of common knowledge events because I want I, I always had the dream of making work that's accessible that can be seen by you know people at universities but also by, by um, people in subway trains or you know it's not for the I never thought that my work is only for a few selected um, people, but for anyone who cares to look at it. Hmm. Well, I, I think the question, Alan's question, really does kind of get at this um, tension or juxtaposition or... Yeah, okay, that, I'm sorry, I forgot to... And, and that is actually something that, um, that will come also, for example, when we watched The Simpson Verdict, you had this very flat animation style and then you had this very rough soundtrack in the, and that was actually just a patch in the, originally I wanted to recreate the sound with voice actors, but then I found that this very scratchy, bad soundtrack worked really well with this kind of clean image. And I often find that, you know, opposites attract each other rather than finding like a smooth things where everything falls in line. It's better to put things in place that contradict each other or, and so maybe the contradiction between the heaviness of the subject matter and the lightness of the image is what, uh, yeah, why yeah. I still care to look at this. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's kind of, that's how you make poetry, right? You take this and you take this and they're not necessarily words or ideas that you would think go together, but you, you, you experiment and you put them together and you get something entirely different. Um, and, and, um, maybe this is, this is the experimentation. Uh, you, you make a lot of work, you don't send it all out there. You know, when does it, when, you know, when, when does it become magical? And, 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 um, and that's what's, that, that is very exciting. It's very exciting about this work as, as quote unquote simple as it may seem. It's actually tremendously uh, compelling and tremendously exciting. Um, we do have to talk about the title, The Unbearable Lightness of Being and, and our friend Mona Kolko here. Um, wants to know why you chose it. Of course, it's a popular book. And you and I even uh, talked about uh, Prague Cafe culture in the late 60s mm -hmm. and uh, Milan Kundera's book and, and the movie that was made uh, mm -hmm. from that book. 
So yeah, the way I remember it was uh, I finished the piece and then maybe a week later, I had a studio visit from the Whitney curators and I felt, you know, I can't show them this piece without a title. So I was in a hurry to find a title and I just made like a list of possible titles. And the first one was Assassinations of American Presidents. And it was just kind of a quick brainstorm and somehow the unbearable lightness of being landed on there. And that was the one that um, I, I felt had the kind of biggest poetic potential, mm -hmm. but I didn't necessarily research. Uh, I've seen the movie uh, based on Milan Kundera's uh, book, but I hadn't read the novel. And, you know, because I needed a title, I'm like, this is the title. Yeah. And, uh, but then I later learned that there's actually a really uncanny connection between this book and these events, because the book by Milan Kundera starts with um, a quote by Nietzsche, uh, where he talks about the theory of eternal return, which is, means that history kind of goes in cycles. And uh, the way that this video works is really almost like an illustration of this uh, philosophical idea that history goes in cycles and events happen over and over again. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to now uh, move to another image. Um, and I, I guess I don't want to spend too much time on the on these images of the history of the photography remix, but but we should tell us about this picture barbershop. Yeah, um, this is based on a Walker Evans. It's kind of uh, similar to the previous one in that it's kind of a canonical image from the history of photography. This is from his FSA series where he traveled through the South and uh, other regions of the United States during the Grand Depression. And I just, uh, I'm, the way I work is always, uh, I took a history of photography class when I was in grad school. I was thinking, which Walker Evans should I do? And this is the one that kind of stuck with me, uh, this image of a barbershop in the South. And I just drew it. And I don't know, uh, I don't know what it is about it. This is also the first, I thought of myself as a video artist until I made this series. And this was the first kind of 2D work that I made that was um, collected by institutions. So somehow this image has some kind of, um, even though it seems very innocent and almost vacant, there's so much going on in this um, image. Uh, why, yeah. Hmm. Um, you know, there, uh, so if you're if you're if you're a student of photography, and I am not, but at one point you were Kota, you know, you, and and you're studying the canon, you know, you're kind of your your sort of tip average intro to photography course, and your average intro to photography textbook, um, you're not going to see this picture, or maybe maybe I mean, these days you might, but I mean, of course, a picture of this very recognizable image of, of a UFO is not something that we normally associate with the, the great moments in the history of photography. So you're really shifting your lens it moves and it refocuses and um, you're, you're not, it's, it's a different kind of history of photography. Is it your, is it Kota Izawa's history of photography? Um, maybe, uh, or maybe it's everyone's history of photography. I feel history, I feel everything is the history of photography. For example, uh, uh, nowadays we always see these delivery vans stop in front of car uh, houses and deliver packages. And if the person is not um, at home, the delivery person takes a picture of the package in front of your house and sends you the picture. I feel these pictures will be part of the history of photography because I mean, uh, now, uh, yeah, photography constantly changes and there's these photos of packages I don't think existed until, you know, a couple of years ago. And uh, yeah, I, I felt with this, in the beginning, I said this project started with kind of recreating the canon of photography, but I find it very dangerous to make art about art. It's then it becomes like a, again, like a 
closed circle that only art geeks can enjoy. And I'm not really into that. I prefer to work, do work that other people can connect to. And maybe not everyone can connect to everything that I do. And that's also not, that's fine. But uh, I want to leave access for people who don't care about Rojenko or Walker Evans. Um, there's, um, yeah, I, I've got Warhol in the brain because we're really excited about this big uh, season of Warhol and, and uh, four exhibitions and installations that will be opening at, at the Memorial Art Gallery on October 25th. Um, and, you know, War, Warhol famously, I mean, he was really good at selecting subject matter and, and people and moments. And, he, you know, we, we think of him as somebody who had his finger on the pulse of sort of what was important in the culture at a given moment. Um, and, and we talk about him as, uh, you know, as being a mirror to our society. Um, you know, the famous Velvet Underground song, I'll Be Your Mirror. Um, and I feel like, I mean, are you, you're holding up a mirror to, in this body of work, to this so-called history of photography. And I keep wanting to find out, you know, you're holding the mirror, Kota, and, um, and, and I, I, but, but you're pretty good at deflecting my, my, my questions about, you know, what does this tell us about you? I'm, I'm not sure that what you want to say on that, on that, you know, you, these are things you'd say pop into your head, but, but, but are you, are, are you really um, a, a taxonomist? Do you kind of want to parse the world um, uh, and, and make sense of it that way? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, this is a really deep question. Um, the, uh, the image of holding a mirror is something that I have in my mind many times. And that's, uh, that's really also how I see it. I see myself as holding up a mirror, but I also see myself as constructing a mirror. It's, you know, if I just wanted to hold up a mirror, I just go to Home Depot, buy a mirror and hold it up. But uh, what I'm trying to do is to make a very kind of um, unique mirror that um, shows mirrors, what sketches in the mirror, but mirrors it in a very specific way that I design. That's maybe how I should put it. Yeah, and I think your mirror um, is including images within certain categories of thinking or discussion that we wouldn't normally put into, you know, that, that mirror. So if you were really wanting to reflect the history of photography, um, as I understood it before we kind of had this conversation and I was looking at your art, then, you know, the UFO, I'm, there's more, there's, there's, there, there's um, the Hibernia bank robbery. So this is um, Patty Hearst in San Francisco. Yeah, uh, this is uh, this is actually a surveillance camera image of a bank robbery by the um, the Bay Area based terrorist group that um, um, Patty Hearst was recent uh, briefly joined uh, involuntarily, and uh, it's also it's a famous photo. Um, but why I included it is well, because I feel that also introduces another perspective, the perspective of a machine, how the machine sees the world and the surveillance camera, which has, you know, there's surveillance cameras everywhere now, but I think it was still fairly new in the early 70s. Thank you. So, um, and here's a, a, an, an advertisement, right? An, uh, uh, an image of an average. I'm gonna now click through, I'm, gonna I'm happy to share these images that we have from the History of Photography remix. Um, especially relevant to us in Rochester, of course, Kodak being uh, this uh, uh, a company that uh, we are very closely associated with. Um, this is maybe one of my favorite ones from this. Oh, really? Movie. Tell me why. Yeah, because I also like work to be self-referential. So this is a slide of a slide, you know. It's, uh, it's <laughs> I produced this as a 35 millimeter slide of a 35 millimeter slide. And now it's a slide in your slideshow. So yeah, I like that, that images talk about themselves and not just about the world at large. 
it is worth noting that this history of photography remix can be shown in its entirety, right? As slides projected in a gallery with a rotating carousel. Yeah. And that's so what was done at the same time as the 16 millimeter film. So that the, there was a few exhibitions. One was at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut, where there was just two pieces in the show. There was a slide projector and the 16 millimeter film projector, and they occupied two uh, big galleries. Hmm. One showing the history of photography remix and while the other one showing the unbearable lightness of being. Oh, beautiful. This is a work that everyone can enjoy at the Memorial Art Gallery uh, on view there, John and Yoko. Uh, this is a work from the same series that's currently on view at the George Eastman Museum, Nan and Brian in bed. And I encourage everybody to actually see the works because the way in which they're shown, I mean, they're on light light boxes. So they're backlit, which is something we're all very accustomed to these days. In fact, we seem to flock to our backlit screens um, like moths at this point in history. So there's something prescient about, about a work uh, like this made in 2006, one year before iPhones were invented um, and sold. The and the idea of the slide, I mean, you're really engaging a particular history of photography in, in terms of the way that you present the images. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a little bit of a, uh, like I said, I understood myself as a video artist for the longest time. And this series was the first time where I kind of, but uh, uh, I also didn't really have, uh, a specific idea where my work would be shown. And I thought mm, maybe film festivals would show my videos, but the spaces that were really interested in showing my work were galleries and museums. And I saw all this you know, beautiful work at the galleries. And then if I show at these spaces already, why should I not also enter this world and make two dimensional work that you can hang on the wall? And then the light box kind of became a natural first step into that world because the light box still looks a little bit like a TV, except that the image doesn't change. But otherwise it was kind of a familiar territory already. And yeah. Um, I just want to encourage people to keep the questions coming. I, I want to end this part of the conversation. I want to uh, answer some more of the questions that any of you may have for Kota. I'm going to fast forward. We have a lot um, in this talk, but I'm now going to, I'm actually going to just zip through some things. These are, this is actually a public work of art. This is a small sculpture that um, Kota made in 2008 called Hand Vote in Selection Season. So here you go. Um, and uh, there's a lot to say and, and talk about with this work, but it did ultimately evolve into a public work of art. And you can see he changed the, the skin tones of, of, of these voters in the final work, which I think w was on view in Washington, DC, right, Kota? That's right, yeah. Kind of better engaged the, the community around the actual sculpture is your intention, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, I, public art is just like the light boxes is something I hadn't planned out to do, but because my subject matter is oftentimes fairly accessible, uh, I was asked to do public art. And this was one of the first public art pieces uh, I got invited to do. And just when I uh, you know, did site visits and so forth, I realized that the public that encounters a, an artwork in a square, at, this is Canal Park in Washington DC, is very different from the public that encounters an artwork at um, Gallery in Chelsea. And so I felt that the, the, the work also has to kind of greet and invite whoever walks through this park. And Washington DC, and that area of Washington DC is a very mixed neighborhood and I felt people have to some, if you show a crowd of people, people have to kind of see themselves in there. Mm. Otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Mm. Um, um, as much as I love this video, I, I guess we have to show it. I, I mean, I, I want to get to the video, uh, an excerpt of the video that's actually on view at Deborah Ronan Fine Art in, in okay. Washington. But um, let's, let's, uh, let's.
get enough of that that one um you know the beatles right our sweet early beatles maybe that's the ed sullivan show uh, sullivan show and then you've got uh, the dead kennedys i'm gonna help our audience out uh california uber Alice. this was a, a 1979 post-punk song that kind of um <laughs> And it suddenly puts puts the idea forward that Jerry Brown is this guy who's going to like take over the world with hippie fascists or something like that. And and so there is a question here, um, you know, how so people are confused. Beatles, Uber, California. You're referring to Nazism, and you're referring to, of course, the Beatles. You're referring to now your home state. Um, post-punk um, is this this is what we're, we're talking about earlier I guess a little bit of poetry maybe yeah or chemistry and I must say you know uh, uh, punk is also very I'm kind of too a tiny bit too young to be a real punk but I'm I was in a punk band when I was in high school and it's kind of the um, yeah it's a uh, punk is also something that's really in my veins and how I think f about the whole viewer in um, I feel punk is a very generous art form also punk bands really thought very much about their audience they were not trying to impress everybody how good they can play guitar they just wanted to attack the audience or assault the audience with their music and I think uh, it, the game is the same you want to have uh, emotional response by the audience so that what uh, why I have a very dear spot for the dead Kennedys and other punk bands I love that video okay um, so I, I'm gonna where are we on our clock yeah it's 753 um, let's just go straight these are all the stolen art some of the stolen artworks from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum I mean there's so much to discuss and enjoy um, this is, um, bear with me. Because we, we, maybe we leave that one if we have tons of time. Yeah, there we yeah, go. Yeah, let's, let's move on to uh, this work of art, which was featured in the 2019 Whitney uh, Biennial, and really the talk of, of, of the art world, and a, 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 a key work in that exhibition, um, an, uh, a, a central piece in, in the ideas that animated that particular Whitney Biennial. This is the work that is on view at Deborah Ronan Fine Art in Rochester, New York. And along with this video, which we're about to see an excerpt from, uh, are, are the watercolors and other works related to the video. So here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, Kota, we have a question from our audience. What made you choose this rendition of the, U the, of the, of the, Amer the U.S. national anthem? Um, I was uh, well on the way making this film and uh, I struggled with the sound. The early version of this uh, video was just an assemblage of the national anthems as they were performed during these protests. And it became very kind of jumpy and atonal and kind of hard to uh, relax into. And then I just uh, went on a wild, wild and wide search for national anthem performances and I came upon this one. And uh, I feel it kind of connected itself to the image right away. And it gave the whole piece a, um, I feel it's, it's a very big part. This uh, soundtrack is a very big part of the piece. Mm -hmm. And um, I normally don't use, I mean, with the exception of the dead Kennedys, I normally don't use music. It's a kind of a new thing for me. And in this special circumstance, I also felt that um, uh, I had to contact the musicians. They were very generous and uh, let me use their performance um, uh, for this video. I mean, another answer that I would have is <laughs> special about this performance of the national anthem is that it's uh, instrumental and that there's no, uh, vo there's no vocal performance. And I feel the images do what the, it mirrors kind of the action and also it lets actually the players be the vocalists in a way. They, what they're saying with their actions becomes the lyrics of the anthem. I mean, I have to say there, there I, I've seen this a number of times and I just got this really clear sense for me, I don't, uh, of, 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 of warmth and even patriotism. Um, it, 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 it's emo it's it, it relatively emotional, you know, overtly emotional in a synchronous way that really comes together with the music and also the the translucency and the shimmering quality of the watercolor. Um, are you, what causes the shimmering quality, the movement within the watercolor? Are they different images? I mean, uh, yeah, okay. you can see is the, these photographers walking through. Okay, uh, hold, give me one second. Okay. Okay, here's some like um, takeouts from the animation. So the way I do it now, I just have two, but I paint every image three times wow. and then I loop them. And it's, I don't know, it was just kind of an experiment. It makes the, it took me uh, a year and five months to make this one and a half minute film uh, because I had to paint everything three times. Mm. But it's just, uh, I feel, you know, art is not about efficiency or uh, doing something as quickly as possible. <laughs> so I felt it just takes however long it takes. And, but that creates this kind of shimmering effect because it's the same image that you're watching. If, you, uh, if I just had one watercolor and kind of panned over it, it would look very, I want to say digital. And this way, I feel the kind of quality of water, the imprecision of water in comparison to the digital animations that you saw earlier kind of go, comes more to the forefront. Well, you, you continue to evolve in very, very exciting ways. Um, oh, I was just gonna give you a big giant compliment, but now we have another question and I love getting questions from, from our audience. Um, the wide shots of the stadium and national anthem appear to be rendered with no spectators. Um, can you tell us more about that choice? This was a moving piece, so so wild to see it in a webinar. Okay, so there were spectators, but there were no players. Um, so this uh, <laughs> these anthem pro protests continue. Uh, you probably know all the NBA games and also national football games uh, have seen anthem protests in but these are the very early protests the first ones that happened and not every team 
did these protests in the same way. And the empty stadium and the um, helmet that you see on a bleacher is by a team, the Tennessee Titans, who, um, who just decided to stay in the locker room during the anthem. And so that was kind of, that's how I tried to depict this image. It's also, I mean, you know, and again, I'm not, this is not a didactic film. This is not a documentary film, you know, uh, you, uh, but I feel it kind of creates a certain visual break before you see Colin Kaepernick, uh, who is the instigator of this whole movement. So I found it had a place in this film. A little bit of um, set, setting the stage for something uh, dramatic. Um, I, I, we're, 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 we've been at this for an hour at least. I, I, I wanna thank you, Kota, so much. Um, I was saying that your work continues to involve, evolve in such exciting ways. And I, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by what you do, what you make, and, and also how it is presented, how we get to see it, not normally on a Zoom webinar, of course. Um, the best way is to see it in person, and that's why I really encourage everybody to, to get out in Rochester. Um, um, and Allison here is adding, uh, it, paradoxically, in this case, there's such tenderness in the work. And I, and I, I agree, Allison. It's, um, it, there's a, there's a kind of richness and, and a revealing quality, which is, I feel quite um, bold or courageous that the boldness of the earlier work is, is of a different character altogether. And um, there's, there's a, um, a different sense of the personal and the handmade and, and, um, and, and the way the, the shimmering quality of light uh, through watercolors and so forth that, that animates these, these videos in, 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 in altogether new ways. Um, well, if, if the trajectory of your career is any uh, sign, then I, it would seem to me that the best is still yet to come. So um, I, I really wish you uh, all the luck and, 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 and fortune and health and happiness and productivity really uh, in the world because I'm excited to see what comes next now. And we have an image of what comes next, but we don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the sad part. Um, so thank you. I want to just uh, close with a couple of comments for our audience here. And again, thank you. Thank you, Kota, so much for taking the time and for sharing your art with us here uh, on the Zoom webinar and also in Rochester. I mean, this is you know, this is a Kota moment in Rochester, New York. So I hope everybody gets out and, and takes advantage of the opportunity. Um, a little bit of information on that score. Um, uh, we have, uh, we're not gonna watch that again. We're not gonna watch that. Um, but this is the information about the exhibition uh, at Deborah Ronan Fine Art taking, uh, Kota Azawa taking a knee. So it's on view starting tomorrow at R1 Studios grab a screenshot or whatever, you know, um, write it down, check out the exhibition. I can't wait, I haven't seen it yet. I'm really looking forward to it. I, I do wanna give a special thank you to Deborah Ronan for making all of this possible. I mean, it was her exhibition that got us all thinking about Kota Ozawa and how we could make the most of this wonderful opportunity that, that Deborah is affording the community here, all of us in Rochester. Who, who, who can get out and take a look around and see some art. So, you know, don't, don't miss the opportunity. Um, a little bit of a plug for what's coming next at the MAG. We're really excited about our season of Warhol, which is gonna be on view for five months, which is so long. We normally don't uh, show an exhibition uh, for so long, but, um, or suite of exhibitions for so long, but we were able to make changes to our schedule to accommodate, you know, lower capacities so that as many people uh, who want to see uh, our season of Warhol, which is the first exhibition of Warhol in Rochester. So uh, it's sort of an introduction for folks here. So uh, do come out. And um, with that, uh, I just want to, again, thank you, Kota. You've been a real a, a, a generous friend and a, a joy and a delight. You, you, you are as welcoming and as warm and as generous as your, your art is. Um, so uh, all of that that, that, that definitely plays out. That's where your personality maybe shows through the most. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan, for having me. All right. Well, take care, everybody. Have a great, great evening. Enjoy the weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming.